a lot of announcements really um just a lot going on in november and uh in december uh sounds like we had a, another great morning uh at the church hey furs hey there right i'll be here in just a second cool we're just doing some announcements good uh, had a great morning at church with the the missions group it sounds like from what i've heard from lee and conrad um and Becky said it was pretty cold. So <laughs> um, another great day there. Um, and then we've got several events coming up in November. Uh, one being the drive-in uh, communion service on November 8th. And that'll be at five o'clock this time. We're gonna change the time and see how that goes. And maybe the sun will be more favorable at that hour. Um, this Sunday is, uh, is the time change. So everything's going to feel very different next week. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Um, and then, uh, uh, we, we made that change actually from move. We moved that service originally. It was November 1st, but it's going to be November 8th. Uh, and the reason was that was the reason for that was my dad's memorial service is this Sunday. And so, uh, thanks for, um, being, uh, adaptable here <laughs> so um and i'll try to pass on that uh, uh the link it's an online service i'll try to pass that along it's going to be on uh my parents church's youtube page and uh so anyway everybody's welcome um and then uh next wednesday this is our last uh being baptist this is our last time to be baptist together um, <laughs> and, uh, next week we are going to have kind of a prayer time around the fire, um, on Wednesday night, uh, at six 30, if you're willing, come with a mask and we'll sing some campfire songs, uh, pray together and, uh, and read a scripture. I just got this new kid's Bible, which comes highly recommended. And so, um, we might, I've been encouraging, uh, you know, our families that, Hey, make this, uh, fireside vespers your, uh, story time for the evening. Uh, so we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Um, and then we've got our, uh, this year, instead of a Thanksgiving meal, we are going to do a Thanksgiving service in the courtyard. And, um, and so that'll be on, Sunday night, actually, November 22nd, and that's the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And then we're looking right now, our plan is to have some uh, Advent services at 9 a.m. in the sanctuary for those who are um, feel comfortable with that. We'll be masked and, uh, and physically distant. I don't see that as a huge, I don't think that'll be a big crowd. Um, but that's just an opportunity to uh, to be together, even as we are uh, apart. Um, we've we've got a pretty consistent group on our 11 a.m. worship online, and so we'll try to keep that up um, for the foreseeable future until things clear up. And who knows when that'll be? <laughs> um, hopefully sooner than later. But anyway, uh, that's that as far as. Uh, announcements is there anything i'm leaving out any, anybody else have any um burning word i have a funny story for you before before we uh before conrad starts about the drive-in service tell us so uh brother gary my i was asking dad for the last drive-in service we had uh how he thought everything went and he said it was great. He really did enjoy it, and and uh, all you know, all the the worship time and the singing. But then his tone changed, and he goes, "But I'm very, I'm very surprised that your pastor was not there. Like, why wouldn't the pastor?" <laughs> and then he became judgmental, like, "Why, why would he miss that?" And I was like, "Dad, you know, he presided over the service. He was the moderator. He gave the sermon." And then he gave the closing blessing. He goes, that kid? That was the pastor. <laughs> I was like, dad. So, <laughs> well, so just so you know, in my dad's eyes, you're that kid. 
Well, that's that's good. I, my hair is getting more gray, so I didn't know I was, if I was going to get that. But well, I, he didn't recognize like, you with the beard and the hair. <laughs> I guess so. Well, that's funny. Um, well, we will be doing that again uh, November 8th. We had a good time last time. I hope you'll come out again. Uh, and that'll be a time also to remember that we'll be celebrating Memorial Sunday, kind of remembering uh, those who have died over the past year. Um, and also just, you know, I, I think in this season of there's so much, there's so much loss, um, uh, not just those who have, who have died or died of COVID or, or whatever. Um, all of us have experienced some sense of, of loss and there's plenty to lament. And so I, I hope to make space for that as well, uh, just because that's such an important part of our own mental health. There's so much lamenting in the Bible. I mean, there's actually a book called Lamentations, right? I mean, so, um, and I think there's a reason for that. I, I think there's, um, you know, they, they've done scientific studies of the last several years about the um, health benefits of tears. Uh, and, and that grief, that lament just needs to get out of us. Um, and so the more we can do that, I think in healthy uh, ways communally, uh, the more we can uh, move past resentment and on to Thanksgiving. Um, well, with that, or what, uh, what prayer requests do we have today? Um, we've got Kelly Smith has surgery coming up next Tuesday. Um, and let's see, I'm trying to think of, uh, of who else. There's uh, been several uh, folks on our um, kind of prayer list recently. Uh, Tasha Kane, as many of you know, was diagnosed with, with cancer a few weeks ago. Um, and so keep her in your prayers. I don't think yet they still know exactly what it is, um, but there's... Um, but keep her in your prayers. Any others? I'd be praying for John Rowland, excuse me, uh, with Linda Rowland's death a few weeks ago. Uh, that funeral service was at their kind of home church over in Baytown uh, last week. So keep John in your prayers. Yeah, another, another hurricane uh, hitting um... Louisiana, our daughter and son-in-law are writing the path of it. So, oh, yeah. keep keep sharing, share fun. She's still in, halfway through her chemo, and it's been rough, but she's doing. She's she's strong. Yeah. Patty, I call a friend of mine. Um, uh, tech, I mean, sent me a message yesterday. Her husband, who is a former pastor, and he's working for the school system now in Midland, Texas, um, fainted last Friday and uh, while he was on duty at school. And mm. uh, so they thought it was just loss of blood at that time, and but decided to do further tests. And they found out yesterday that he has a tumor in his, es in his esophagus, stage four cancer. Mm. Just, just like that, just quick. So they're dealing Kind of like, you know, I'm sure what, what, uh, what the Canes are de dealing with. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's just fast. Barbara? Uh, pray, continue to pray for Diane Farrell. She, she's just really having a rough time. Um, and, I mean, she's posted this, so it's not a secret, but with depression. And um, it's particularly hard for her to teach virtually she teaches college and um and last week she had to have her 12 year old cat put down so it's just it's just a lot of stuff going on yeah hmm. two of my students uh one has a young woman uh, 25 years old, and she, both she and her husband had COVID-19. As of last night, their test was showed asymptomatic. Uh, another one of my students, both of her parents, uh, she's from Mexico, and both of her parents and her grandfather have COVID-19. Uh, the parents are doing better. The grandfather's not extremely bad, but uh, 
she's she's anxious about how quickly things could change for her and because of the situation she cannot go to Mexico to be with her family. So, uh, for, so two of my students, we've talked about COVID, but now it becomes more of a reality within our congregation as well. So, uh, it's not just the enemy out there; it's it's a it's a damaging impact on those who are close to us. Well, let's pray together. And the victims of the fire in uh, Colorado and California. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for reminding us that. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, uh, there are so many concerns, uh, so much weighing on our hearts, on our minds today. Uh, we pray that you would be with all these that we have mentioned, uh, because Lord, we know that the list goes on and on. Uh, there are so many uh, with prayers unspoken uh, for those who are hurting, for those who are feeling really disconnected and, and alone right now. Lord, we pray that somehow uh, your peace would find them. We pray that uh, we pray for us, your church, that we might be a source of light and warmth and comfort in this time, even when we have to be physically distant. We pray for all those who are going through treatment right now or facing uncertainty uh, with their health, whether from COVID or cancer. Lord, we pray that somehow uh, your healing would find them, somehow your hope would sustain them, uh, for the treatment that lies ahead. God, we pray that you'd be with our church. Uh, help us to be a source of light. Help us to leverage all that we are and all that we have uh, for your kingdom. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I'll turn it over uh, to Conrad to talk about organizational polity and Woodland. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, begin with uh, Romans uh, 12 5 it says so in Christ we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others polity is is nothing more than how an organization and we're speaking here of church so I'll use church um, governs itself and and decides a structure of of, um, of leadership and decision making uh, and Baptists are a little unique uh, from other denominations in how we go about church polity. Uh, the first thing that, that differentiates us from other many denominations is that <clears throat> no one person, no one group of people inside or outside of the church tells the local church how to govern itself, what to believe, or hence the religious practices of that local church. Um, this is not the, the time for it, but of course, you know that that has some negative and some positive things uh, uh, about it. But that's how we, we believe in the priesthood of believers and the local church uh, um, in, in making decisions uh, about the will of God for that church. Furthermore, um, we believe that each um, member of a Baptist church is a, is a priest, is, a, we, is the priesthood of believers. So therefore, there, no one in, uh, on earth or, or in heaven uh, can, needs to go between us and God. We can go directly to God to determine the will of God for our own personal lives. And when we come together, for, for the church. Um, now we decide on, as a church, a Baptist, um, as far as what to approve and what not to approve by majority vote. Every, because of the priesthood of believer, every member of a Baptist church has a voice and a vote in deciding God's will. Now that does not mean that we are a democracy. Uh, democracy is a political term that means the rule of the people. We believe that Christ is the head of the church. And we believe that Christ is the one that through the church members, the Holy Spirit guiding the church members by vote, the will, composite, the, the corporate vote, the will of God is, is done. And, and Christ is the leader, not, not the church. We also believe that because of Christ is the head of the church, that the pastor is not 
the, the head of the church, uh, the deacons, the board of deacons is not the head, the, the head of the church. Um, I've perhaps like many of you, I have been in churches that that has been the case, um, either one or both together. And uh, that's not what we believe as Baptists that scripture teaches. T uh, pastors have an incredible, incredibly important role in the leadership of the church, the spiritual leadership of the church, um, and, and they receive from God at, and they pass on to us. Um, just like in the Old Testament, Moses, God told Moses, pick 70, I will speak to you, you will speak to them, and they will help you speak to the people. We still believe that in the, in the New Testament, Barnabas and Paul uh, ordained elders to, to help them in the ministry. The deacons in Acts were ordained to help in the ministry. The pastor has an incredible role, but he is not the leader of the church. Christ is the leader um, of the church. By the way, just so I'll, th this is free. I won't charge you for this. Uh, but a lot, a lot of members, once they call a pastor and have a pastor of the church, they forget. Um, and I, I think it's Hebrews... Third, third, the 13th chapter of Hebrews, uh, towards the end or the middle, I think maybe seven or se verse seven or 17, that it says that at the, the church, the members of the church, the body of Christ, is to make the work of the pastor a joy and not a burden. And uh, I have been in churches, Baptist churches, that sometimes that has been forgotten after the vote is called uh, to, to call a pastor. Okay, so, so that's how basically Baptists have decided to, uh, to, to govern themselves. Uh, many churches like ours, um, in order to facilitate the governing of the church, because not every decision requires a church vote. That would be a lot of work, a lot of business meetings, a lot of voting. There, there are some decisions that, that can be done uh, in smaller groups. And most churches like ours uh, have committees that do the ministry and decide how they are going to do the ministry, how they are going to spend the money that has been uh, allocated and approved on a budget by the church in a business meeting and, and, and have, uh, but, you know, uh, not just committees, but perhaps a, a, a body that decides uh, through bylaws that the church has already established, voted upon and accepted through bylaws that gives these committees and this uh, perhaps governing body the authority uh, within the bylaws to make uh, decisions. Okay, so that's polity in, in, a, in a general sense from most Baptist churches. So what does it mean? How does that flesh out uh, as being Baptist uh, at Woodland? within the polity of, of how Woolen has decided to govern itself. Well, we have, like most churches, standing committees. Committees decide, as I've said, how they're gonna do their ministry and they have the authority to make decisions within the purview of the bylaws and, and the parameters of the bylaws and the budget that has been given them. Um, who, who sits on these committees? We have a committee on committees that decides who sits on these committees and presents it to the church at the last business meeting of the year, which this year will be, uh, I believe, 16 December. Um, and, and, and the church votes on next year's committee members. So the committee on committees is very important. So who sits on that committee? The, the, the deacons decide who sits on the committee of committees and again, at the end of the, the, the year, the church votes on, on approving this committee. Um, the, church count, the church, I believe maybe four years ago, decided that the way that we were structured um, in governance was a little um, inefficient, uh, perhaps a little um, not as effective because the, what we had a church council that, that was composed of every committee member, 
plus every staff member um, on, on that committee. It was huge. Um, I was chosen to, I was voted upon to, to sit on the church council when it changed over to what we have today. And I'll explain that in a minute. But my, la my first meeting was the last meeting of the old. And it was huge. It took up just about all of um, um, our fellowship hall. And uh, discussions were long. Uh, again, it was inefficient and, and, and um, it, it, it was just not a very good way the church decided to, to govern and make this, the smaller decisions that committees and church council should make. So they decided uh, to have a, a restructure the governance of the church and have a smaller church council, um, which would be composed of four at-large members serving a four-year term and three ex-official members, the chairs of the finance, the personnel, and the buildings and grounds committee, and the church pastor as a non-voting member. Now, that does not mean that this small church council makes all the decisions for the church. It does not. All it means is that, that those decisions that were made before in a much bigger group with a lot more discussion are now decided by a smaller group within the parameters of the bylaws of the church and the authority granted to this church council by the, the adopted governance that the church voted upon and adopted uh, again approximately uh, five five years ago um, the church council anyone any member can go to the church council they are not secret meetings they can bring up they can ask the church council to this to discuss anything to consider anything and the church council will, if it's uh, demanded of them, the church uh, council, if it's asked of them, I'm sorry, the church council receives a report from every committee because every committee is a subcommittee of the church council. And the church council looks at these so that there is try to avoid as much duplication of work as possible and, and, and authorize the works of, of the, uh, the different committees. Um, and, and, uh, and again, the church council is not a, a governing body. It just makes the, the decisions within the bylaws. And if anything needs to be brought up to the church, the church council um, brings it up for, for a vote uh, to the church. Information is disseminated to the church as you have seen during since March more than any other time uh, through email, through church, um, Sunday school uh, communication, through the twig, through announcements. Um, and, um, it, it, and, and we believe, and it has worked very well, especially since I've been, maybe it was three years ago, since I've been on this uh, church council, it has worked, worked I, in my opinion, very well to streamline the decision-making of, of uh, Woodman Baptist Church. Um, and, in a nutshell, that's briefly what it means to be a Baptist at Woodland Baptist Church with its church polity. Questions, discussions? Well, it was it was it was 2017 where we uh, we switched our governance, um, and uh, as you said, part of the reason we or big reason we did that is um, is we really wanted to figure out better ways to be efficient with our uh, with our governance um, and we began to it seemed like the um, some of the uh, some of the polity of the church was meant to be uh, was a lot of ways meant to be obstructive um, and uh, I, the, that may sound bad, but um, uh, there's, well, I'll say this. When we started reviewing and reading about church governance um, and thinking about governance um, at Woodland, 
that there was a small committee, um, an ad hoc committee of council, of course, um, uh, because we got to where that's how that's that was the only means of getting anything done was ad hoc committees of council, because the council was so big, it was like, it wasn't really as much of a working committee as much as a as a hearing with you know 25 to 30 people in the room and so um, we started reading this book on church governance from the Alvin Institute which is a church consulting group and they started describing kind of the means of how churches grow and uh, throughout history how things change and you know you set up the church like this and you know, when you're a young church and, and you've got 75 to 125 people in the church and there's four standing committees and then your church council, which makes the decision, is the standing committee with the um, pastor. And then you've got that set up and that works really well, but then you start adding committees. And then, um, and then the work of those committees becomes so large that they have co-chairs. And then you've got 13 standing committees and, um, and 24 co-chairs <laughs> and then uh, seven to eight staff members. And um, it, it can get pretty, pretty wild after a little while. Um, and we started reading this book and we're like, oh my goodness, this, um, we, we, we're a unique special church, but this evidently our story is not unique um, uh, because there's just certain sociology uh, that our structure was was fighting against, and this is probably way more than you wanted to hear. Um, I just wonder, is that, I'll throw this question out there to you all. I think that there's there's much more needed in congregations. Uh, you need good policy, and then you need good kind of practice, um, and whatever structure you have. If you don't have, if you don't have um, congregational faith uh, in each other, then no congregational structure or polity will work. Um, you, as Conrad says, there's going to be stuff that you tip it. You have to, you have to trust a committee to do. You have to trust a council or, or the deacons, and if you don't have that trust or faith, um, then things really begin to to bog and break down. Um, what do y'all think about all this? I think there's some things in the chat too. Um, well, let, 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 me, let me say this, uh, that, that uh, ad hoc committee that studied the new governance did it for an entire year. Um, it was a very laborious work. And I remember them going to committees and discussing uh, with committees uh, the what they were thinking about doing and then having uh, open meetings for church members to come and talk about it before it was presented to the entire church for discussion and vote. So it, it was a very thorough job that that ad hoc committee did with, uh, with the changing governance. It was laborious. Um, it was. Um, uh, Patty's got a question uh, in the chat. Uh, do the church council uh, coordinate the church activities calendar? If not, who? Um, I, I would say the council really kind of uh, work. Uh, I, I might say more the committees work to coordinate the council with staff because a lot of our committees are formed or are event based. Maybe I'm wrong on that. Uh, and you can connect me, you could correct me on that. But it seems like a lot of our committees um, have events that they're coordinating and, and they might work through, uh, through council, but a lot of, I think mostly they work alongside staff to kind of coordinate. Yeah. All right, I think Mike has his hand up. Barbara has his, her hand okay. up. All right, Barbara has her hand up. Oh, Mike's Mike's going to talk first. Barbara, sorry. Okay. You guys just I heard. would always, I was always let Barbara go first. Anytime. Oh. 
Uh, I just wanted to say a word of thanks uh, and applaud uh, Garrett, you and Conrad, you for this whole governance bit, because I think our church does a good job of the delicate dance of, of keeping things out there, of organizing things, but also allowing some of the other decisions to be made without having to go through the church. Because where I've been, whenever churches want to go back to where everybody has a vote, everybody has a discussion on everything, you get bogged down and you can't make any progress. And you guys have done a great job of this. And I want to say thank you. I also wanted to maybe kind of throw out there this issue, and that's it's been said to me, and I've witnessed it, is that older people like me uh, like meetings. Actually, I don't like meetings, but older meetings, older folks like meetings, younger people don't. That's why they don't come to business meetings. Uh, how do we negotiate that and get more young folks involved in the process? Uh, and how do we make sure that we keep this process streamlined so that, for instance, they come and be involved for three to six weeks or three to six months, knowing that they're not going to put up a lifetime commitment here, but that they could be involved. Have you guys given any thought to that? I I'm sure you probably have, but I think that's going to be one of the issues as we move into the future is how do we use all the gifts of our young adults? I'm through. That's a good question. Um, I, I do think that uh, it, it seems like younger generations want to be a part of something that matters and um, and want to really focus on kind of the more hands-on work of, uh, of missions. That's, that's kind of the church consultant talk. Um, at the same time, our uh, our younger families, it seems to me, I mean, a lot of them have jumped into um, being on council and committees. Um, and so, you know, I, I think uh, I, th I think what we want to do is just make sure that that the polity and governance structure serves the church and not vice versa. And so we just always want to make sure that it's it's working and something that can um, be conducive to ministry, and not. Um, I got, I got concerned several years ago, four or five years ago, that it seemed like our 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 motto of every member a minister had had been had kind of turned into every member a, a committee member, and. Um, which we are tying up everybody's volunteer hours in committee meetings. Uh, and, and don't get me wrong, I, committee work is essential. I, I mean, I, I think the, uh, the work of these committees and councils is incredible and incredibly useful and um, essential to the church. Um, but it's not the only thing. Um, and it's not the only, uh, only thing that, that matters. And, and so we just wanted to you know, our, our committee structure had grown to the nominating committee needed to fill 110 spots uh, between 100 and 100, 109, I think was one year. And that's just, that's a lot. That's a lot for, um, for any church. Um, but I, th I think it's especially a lot for us. So we tried to kind of see how we can uh, get more people maybe in, in hands-on ministry. Um, I don't think I'm answering your question, but Conrad, take over or somebody. Well, yeah, I, 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 I have I, a question. I have a question. This is Vicki. You can't see me. Hold on. Um, what about you were talking about getting the students involved um, in the poly, polity of the church? Um, what about just posing questions to them, you know, when we're talking to them or in Sunday school, you know, if we, we know something that we're concerned about or, or want some ideas, just pose the question to them whenever we are around them or talking to them, As maybe especially in Sunday school or on the outings, you know, you might, um, I don't know, I'm just, you know, I just talk about everything when I'm with kids um, or with anybody really. Um, so you know, if, if you talk to them, asking them, what do you think, you know, 
we're trying to figure out this issue. Well, what do you think about this? You know, they, you never know what you're gonna come up with. They might just start talking among themselves when they're not around us. Um, and they might just come back to us. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's just one of the ways that I think uh, like Lance as like for the last several years has always, you know, most of the student committee is, is students. And so that's, um, and we've even had, am I remembering this correctly? I mean, we've had uh, youth serve on our church council back in the old days when um, a student, um, when, uh, when we had the student committee on the church council. And part of the reason for forming the Young Families and Singles Committee was to, uh, to bring uh, 20 and 30 year old 30 year olds into um, into being part of uh, of the life of the church and I, I do think are the part of the governance of the church and I do think that that's something Woodland has really done an incredible job of um, as far as I've seen it I mean this church has really looked to share that kind of leadership I mean I think of a great example was when um, when Erica Hanchi and Ed Tweet were kind of chair co-chair of of church council several years ago, and and the ways uh, that that not only happens with you know co-chair uh, church council and vice chair whatever, but that also happens on on various committees as well. Uh, I mean, we we really no longer needed the Young Families and Singles Committee because those Young Families and Singles men members were, were now not only on that Young Families and Singles Committee, but they were on all the different committees. And so we had that age variance um, uh, throughout all the church governance, which was pretty exciting to see. Can I speak to that? Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I, I you can't Barbara. speak. You can't see me, which is probably good for both of us. But uh, I didn't. I didn't voice that as a criticism. I voiced that as is probably a concern as we continue to move into the future of just the way folks are, uh, because my experience on the committees have been that the young adults have been very vital and very much plugged in. But I think that's something that leadership always needs to remember is that, uh, like you said earlier, they, they like hands-on things. Uh, and I do think that they all feel, and I think with Ray and Jenny and the young adult department, they just need to have a place where they can ask questions and have information. And I think they have that and have had that. So I didn't want you hearing my, my question as a criticism. I, I think that's something we do well, but it's something to keep in mind as we move to the future. That, that's a great point. And because it also kind of brings up, and before I get to Barbara, it also brings up the tyranny of the present, which, which is, I, I just mean, um, sometimes that we assume that we only serve those who are here, but as a church, we always want to be reaching out. And so how does our, how does the way we operate um, kind of exclude or those that we, uh, that might otherwise be able to be be here and be a part and and you're right I mean younger generations are probably may, may not be looking to um, to spend an hour a month um, in committee meetings Barbara as someone who came from another denomination with a totally different um, church polity or whatever we're calling this um, I'm really grateful for the way Baptists have done it um, before, and I like I like our change in governance, uh, the way we've done it in the last few years. I think that's more effective. I know I've only been on church council once, and it was awful. I mean, it it was long, and I'm the only way that I am young is that I hate meetings. I'd much rather be active and doing something than sitting in a meeting. But by the same token, and, and maybe you just spoke well to this, uh, Mike and Garrett, 
one of the things that bothers me and I hear from other people is that they feel less involved and and they don't feel like there's enough transparency. And that's, I think that is the struggle in, um, in streamlining the way we do things is to make sure that people feel like they're being heard, whether they're young, old, come faithfully or come four times a year, um, they need to feel like they're involved and they need to know what's happening and not just have something all of a sudden, we're voting on this. Um, and I know I, I compliment you all that you have tried very hard to do that, but that, is, that will always be a problem, I think, in, uh, in Baptist churches. Um, we're not a democracy, but but especially old time Baptists feel like, hey, I need to get my vote in there and I need to have my opinion heard and I need to know what you all are doing. So um, I appreciate how difficult that that tension is. I think that's been a real struggle for us the last three years, especially with um, with really reporting on what council is doing. Uh, I, I don't think we've done that well enough. Um, I, I think we've been a little better this year, but maybe not. I know there have been times when we've posted church council notes and, and everything. It, it's just, um, I don't think that we've done enough to kind of report on the shorthand bullets of like, here's what you needed to know. Um, and at the same time, we've also, you know, we've, we've struggled, I think the last three or four years um, one of the major ways we used to report things, I think, was on Wednesday night. Um, and when I first got here, you know, that Wednesday night crowd was about probably 125 people. Um, and a lot of those people, those were the people that were, mem that were members of the committees. And so um, not only were those kind of the church leaders, but it was also... Uh, you know, you would find out everything that was going on because we would have a business meeting every every month. And so there was constant uh, in-person reporting. Um, and, you know, just things have changed over the past several years to where now, um, you know, our Wednesday crowd is more like 20 to on a good night 50. Um, now we're, we're more generationally diverse now um, uh, because back in 2012, I was the only person there that was under, well, um, I won't say a number. Um, you, were that, you, were that you. Kid, you were that kid. Right. As, as your dad would say, um, shouldn't your dad would say, shouldn't he be an extended session? Instead of, <laughs> um, and uh <laughs> so and so that's that's just changed and it, and it got to where uh you know our wednesday night business meetings were you know 20 to 25 people uh reporting on that you know it's, it's just such a it's just such a different time now but we've got to get better at at reporting Okay, Patty is su suggesting something. Do you want to say anything? Sure. I was. Uh, I didn't know if it, we were going to move on to something else, but just to continue what Mike and uh, commented on already, you know, in the committees that I have served, this seems to be an ongoing uh, concern. Uh, and I remember these discussions and all the various education missions. Um, who else was I on? Uh, Anyway, those the different committees that we've talked, we've talked about this. How do we engage the youth? So I think, and I don't think that was unique. So I think one of the roles, Conrad, of the church council is also to look at where are we missing? Uh, where could we, uh, um, are, are, are there gaps, you know, that our church should be doing with where we're serving? Uh, and, and so it, it would be helpful that that discussion is led by 
the by the church council and however you choose to engage you know comments and feedback just like we did with this with the pandemic in regards to we welcome any thoughts about coming back um and just the same it's just the same thing because i think it is an urgent need for all churches regardless of denomination is how do we develop the next leaders what does that look like and there's some intentionality um to cultivate uh interest and engagement and uh, some young people are want they maybe they they like working in the garden and serving and you know getting rocks or something i mean i don't know where, where it's like, okay ask, match fit let yes. me ask you a question because i think you're an authority on this um i mean for those of you who don't know patty runs with nora the latina leadership institute and so she is a a, a leadership expert and so what are I, I just wonder what are the uh things that you and nora have found over the past many years um that uh, that have been uh keys to helping people uh become leaders I think one of the one of the key ones is a uh, Garrett that I would begin with is that recognition that you do have a gift, you do have a calling. Um, and and exploring with them what that gift or calling is. And in the case of young people, maybe the young, young ones, it's like, what's your interest? What do you like to do and be a, a part of? But it's also uh we intentionally teach organization, we teach administration, that that's a part of what you do in leadership. So um, um, one of the things that I've seen worked at the, st at the state level when I've been involved in um, state leadership is that mentoring of bringing in uh, uh, these young leaders. So they're exposed to how does it work at that level uh, I think the challenges that, that I think generally come with youth, but in particular with people of color, is that um, not only that they do have a voice, but you can do it, the confidence that you can do it, and that you can rise to the different levels, but they've got to watch, they've got to see how it is, see how, to, how it's done, and maybe not publicly call them out and say, you know, the big meaning, okay, Sam, what do you think, you know, I'm just watching that and then their mentor kind of, what would you have done different? What do you see? And then again, it depends on that and it depends on the individual. I mean, there's some, you can call them and say, I think you have another idea, you know, and they go, yeah, we, what if we did blah, blah, blah. Um, so uh, it's an intentionality, uh, Brother Garrett. And, um, we are our, our leaders are identified now well you know in in two countries uh because somebody else recommended them and it's like we see that gift yeah and we think you are a candidate for this you know you um you're kind of you're you're naming what um the fund for theological education or, or exploration is this group that works with young uh seminarians and um, yes. young ministers and they have they describe vocation through uh, the church's role is um, oh it's, I wrote it down because I was thinking about this the other day notice name and nurture uh, so the notice is noticing the gifts of uh, of these individuals and naming it actually saying um, yeah I, I see that you're really good at, at this and then the nurture uh, that y'all do with mentorships. Uh, and also bringing in experts um, who who maybe have similar stories to some of these uh, people uh, and can uh, help them kind of see themselves doing these things. Um, and I've seen Lance through through the years uh, bring some in, some topics that help nurture that that uh, whet the appetite. And I think out of that, with Lance and and the youth leaders, the youth teachers who can also be brought in to say, you know, what, what are you seeing? What do you identify? Because it's got to be next step. So we can present, but, but then what, you know, how, how do we do that? How do we keep the other one is retention. 
how do we keep them? You know, they might say, yeah, I want to be in grounds and committee. And, you know, then they go, oh, that's a lot of business. I don't want to, I don't like that part. And it's just, it's just, okay, but, you know, how do we keep them engaged? Yeah. Okay. Oh, hey there, I have a, a, I have another question. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Um, so keeping them engaged, you, you're talking about the young people wanting, you know, having preferences of doing other things instead of going to committee meetings. Um, I have found um, that for my schedule, Zoom meetings have been awesome. Um, and so maybe Zoom meetings could be a way to reach those younger generation, the younger generation that have very busy schedules. They work all day, eight to 10 hours a day. They have children in daycare or they're coming home and they have a lot to do, but they could turn on their computer and listen, you know, to the meeting. And then maybe, you know, if, you know, just listening to it, they'll slowly get involved and be at least aware of what's going on in the church. And then, you know, at a time, maybe, you know, if they are of, of that, and, you know, if it is of their, of that interest to them, you know, they will become participants. Um, yeah, Zoom, I, think, I think it's a great thing. I think you're turning lemons into lemonade there. You know, I think that's mm -hmm. something that we've uh, found this year uh, that maybe there, maybe Zoom meetings um, are, are a really useful tool, uh, especially to those that might, that don't want to fight traffic or can't, you know. Or busy schedules with their kids. Absolutely. And homework mm -hmm. and ba bathing and supper. Yeah. Um, those are a lot of things that a lot of people go through and just don't have the, after a, a long day work, do not have the energy unless we do the meetings on a weekend and then it's family time. So yeah. there's just an idea. Patty? Uh, this question is for Conrad and it's really just off the top of your head. So in the, in the roughly what, eight months that we've been sequestered the way we have and the way things that, that we do church during this time of COVID, what, do, what have you discovered that you felt like, at, you know, at, in your role in the church council, what are our gaps? What, what could we strengthen? Is there anything that, that comes out at you that says, wow, we, could, we, we, we really need to improve on this or... Or, or we do this well. I mean, what are some thoughts for you? Yeah, um, what piggybacking on what Vicky said about the Zoom meetings, that, that has been incredibly helpful um, to the church council uh, to continue meeting. And as Garrett said, um, <clears throat> you know, not to, especially like for me, which I live far away from the church. Uh, not to fight the traffic. It, it, the, um, the Zoom meetings have, have been much more productive than I thought they, they would be. And, and uh, one of the things that, you know, that I, that I like to see, and perhaps if people uh, would like that, is to continue that even af after we get back to what it is to be a new normal, whatever that is to continue that because it saves a lot of time. Um, you know, you can do, uh, you can spend a lot more time in preparation and, and, and discussion during these meetings. And, and that I, I have found that it's, it, it has been quite a strength uh, for, the, for the church. Um, and then, you know, the lack of, of in-person business meetings um, has been a negative. Um, that that has definitely uh, be, been a negative, and and really it's hard to do, and to get everybody involved, and for them to to have a real discussion when when you're doing uh, business meetings through through email. Um, the sooner we can safely get back to those, the better. It's not going to be this year. Um, I think I'm going to be the, the only church council chair that will never do a business meeting in person, the direct one in person, uh, but, but that's okay. But that, that has been a negative. Um, and, and, I, and I'm listening to you all and, and the, um, what, what Barbara was saying about 
I, I have tried to be as transparent as possible with everything that we, that we have done. Uh, trust me when I say this, that when we need to make a, dis, a, a, a decision, um, I have the bylaw sitting right here as we discuss, and, and I, I, I always say, and you know, we have several people here on the church council, Lee Wimps is there. I say, what about this? What about this? What about, here's what the bylaw says. And I know I drive them crazy, but I wanna make sure that when we make a decision, we are in authority to, to, to make that decision. Now, I, I wish I had thought about it um, in being more transparent about sending the minutes of the church council, they are not secret um, to the church afterwards. And um, I'm gonna inform the church council that we're gonna do this with the church council meeting that we did in October. Um, and, and I have two more and we will do that. And I think that's a great idea. Um, and, and, and we'll start doing that. I don't know if I've answered your question, um, but That, that was a good question. I will say we, um, we, we've done that in the past and you know, we, we're learning a lot about communication uh, this year. Um, and you know, a lot of that is we've been led by Lance and kind of um, a lot of things that he's been learning uh, about communication for the last several years, but especially this year as he's, he's, as he's done a lot of research and been in um been in conferences kind of learning about church communication i don't mean to speak for you lance feel free to jump in but um but you know one of the things we we learned uh from just the communication standpoint is is to send more standalone e emails and so you've seen a lot more <laughs> a lot more emails from uh from church and that's one of the things that we've learned from email marketing campaigns is uh people are less like you might save the twig, but you probably don't read through the entire twig. And so even in years past, <laughs> um, you know, we've, we've had the, the notes to church council uh, from church council meetings posted down at the bottom of the twig and, and nobody saw them because, you know, you have to scroll for a, a, a good minute to get to the bottom of the twig email. Um, and so we're, we're just, we're trying to learn these communication tactics through the year tactics. That sounds like the wrong word, uh, techniques, um, and, and trying to get better about reporting because that is so important. And it's an important part of, uh, of our community trust, uh, to kind of keep that conversation going. And as Conrad has said, I, I do think it's, you know, we've really missed the church business meetings as a time to, um, report what we're working on, but also celebrate kind of the things that have been going on. Um, you know, obviously we haven't, we haven't gotten a chance to celebrate as a community what, um, uh, what y'all have been doing on Wednesday mornings. Um, we haven't gotten the chance to celebrate together, you know, this gift to the San Antonio uh, food bank that's provided 70,000 meals um, as I think, I think I told y'all this last week, that's enough to feed a family of five for over a decade. Um, I mean, so that's, this is exciting stuff that's been going on and we just haven't had the chance as a, um, we haven't had the chance to celebrate our business, um, which is, you know, one of the casualties of COVID. Um, well, y'all it's 101. Um, and I thank you for uh, for being a part of this meeting today. Uh, this meeting, uh, that's we're talking business, so I'll make it a meeting. Um, as we as we go, uh, a twenty second story. Several years ago, Cameron was out of town, and it was just me and Finley. And uh, I think Finley was four or five, and we went to lunch after church with uh, with the Masons uh, and somebody else. I'm trying to remember. It was with the Masons and somebody else and, you know, Linda and Phil and, and me were talking about church stuff. And after on the drive home, Finley goes, wow, I've never been to a meeting before. That was my first meeting. <laughs> wow. 
Uh, but anyway, because you know how serious Phil is. So every time he's around, it just seems like a meeting. Um, well, good to be with y'all today. Uh, Conrad, thanks for your leadership uh, this year on church council uh, and, uh, and today especially. And now, uh, good to be with y'all. God bless.